Good morning. Steve again from Southern Illinois. Welcome to Text Talks. The Fairfield Seventh-day Adventist Church is dedicated to Christ's ministry of providing protection, promoting healing, and restoring relationships with both God and man. In the companion piece, I shared some thoughts that a friend asked me to give to her family this past week at her funeral. Uh, go to the companion video, no please, uh, if you want to, to, to hear those thoughts. Here in Text Talks, we're going to be examining the Bible passages that express the hope that she had as she faced death. Now, as a part of, of uh, sharing with the family, I uh, talked about the three perspectives that Christians have uh, today and have had historically uh, regarding what happens at death. Uh, the first is that we enter immediately into a state called purgatory, where we undergo redemptive suffering as opposed to the punitive suffering of hell. The second is that we enter directly into heaven or hell. And the third is that we enter into a state of unconsciousness um, akin to sleep. The commonest uh, perspective is actually that of purgatory, which comes as a surprise for many of my friends here in the United States, because the most vocal Christians today uh, uh, speak of immediate entrance into heaven or hell. And at most of the sermons that I've been to, that's the perspective that is presented. My friend's perspective was that, that she would become unconscious. Why did she believe that? Here are some Bible passages that she was familiar with that would express the hope that she had. The first is Job chapter 19, verses 25 through 27. I'll be reading from the English Standard Version today, but I encourage you to get your own Bible out and read it so that you have it for yourself. For I know that my Redeemer lives, and at the last he will stand upon the earth. And after my skin has thus been destroyed, yet in my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold, and not another. My heart faints within me. It's popular today to say that the Old Testament contains no hint of the resurrection, that that was not a hope that the Old Testament prophets put forward. It's strange then that the book that those same scholars say is the oldest book in the Old Testament expresses that hope. Now, Ecclesiastes, uh, chapter 9, verses 5 through 6, talks about um, what the dead experience. But he who is joined with all the living has hope, for a living dog is better than a dead lion. For the living know that they will die, but the dead know nothing. And they have no more reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. Their love, their hate, their envy have already perished, and forever they no more share in all that is done under the sun. This passage pretty clearly speaks of death as an unconscious state. Now, it's part of the wisdom uh, literature in the Old Testament, as opposed to the historical, which describes people's experience, or the prophetic, which were direct messages. And yet, Ecclesiastes is quoted in the New Testament as an inspired book. I think we, need to, we have to take this uh, statement as to what, this, what we are like in death. Uh, seriously, our, we have no more love, hate, joy, all of that's past. We have no share in what is going on here on this earth, either in observing it or participating in it. Daniel chapter 12, 
verses 2 and 13. It's the next passage I'd like us to look at. I usually like to look at a group, at contiguous uh, texts, in other words, a, an entire range of texts that without a break. But in this uh, instance, these two texts are separated, but they both address the same thought. The angel is speaking to Daniel, and he says, And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. And then in verse 13, But go your way till the end, and you shall rest, and shall stand in your allotted place at the end of the days. So here again in Daniel, um, the promise of the resurrection and death as sleep are all expressed. And the hope of a resurrection is once again put forward. So what does the New Testament have to say? Now, I have not included the passages where Jesus refers to death as sleep or where he speaks of resurrecting Lazarus as waking him from his sleep. Both of those, All of those passages could be metaphors. A euphemisms. Um, and yet when you put them within the context of all of the other passages in Scripture, um, for me they cease to be metaphors. So looking at John 5, 28 and 29, Jesus is speaking here and he makes reference to resurrection. He says, do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life, and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. He speaks of the dead as still being in the tomb, and he points forward to a future hope of resurrection. Some would be resurrection, resurrected to life. Some would be resurrected to judgment. Since I take the entire Bible as applying to my life and as informing my understanding of what God wants me to understand, um, all of these passages apply to me. Now, I understand that those Christians who separate portions of the Bible as applying to themselves and other portions as only applying to Jews or to um, non-Christians, they don't apply this passage to themselves. It, your picture of inspiration directly affects how you interpret the Bible. But here in John, Jesus is clearly speaking of the dead as being still in the tombs and of the promise of resurrection. 1 Corinthians 15, 51 through 54. So now we're moving forward to the writings of Paul. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. When will we be changed? All of us? At the last trump. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed, for this perishable body must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. I don't know how Paul could be more clear in expressing his perception of death as sleep and of resurrection as being the moment when immortality is imparted to us. He doesn't speak as, of us as being immortal now. He specifically says that we are mortal and we have perishable bodies and that we all will be changed in a moment in the twinkling of eye at the last trump. 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 and 7 through 17. 
But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive and who are left until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we always be with the Lord. Here, Paul once again speaks of the dead as being asleep. And he speaks of our hope for the dead as being tied to Christ's resurrection. He then goes forward and ties that, points to the resurrection that will occur when the Lord himself descends from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, with the sound of the trumpet of God. The resurrection is our hope. And we will sleep until we hear that trumpet, that voice, that command. Revelation 20, verses 1 through 10. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding in his hand the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain. And he seized the dragon, that ancient serpent, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years and threw him into the pit and shut it and sealed it over him so that he might not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were ended. This is what the, this is the passage from which Christians get the millennium concept, the thousand years of peace when Christians, when the, Satan will not be able to tempt people. But notice what comes before and after the thousand years. <clears throat> Jewish writing uses a reiterative process where it goes over the same, same concept, the same uh, idea again from, and again from different perspectives. So now we're going to start with the thousand years over again. Then I saw thrones, and seated on them were those to whom the authority to judge was committed. I also saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus and for the word of God, and those who had not worshipped the beast or its image, and had not received its mark on their foreheads or in their hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. At the beginning of the thousand years is a resurrection. At the end of the thousand years is a resurrection. That at the beginning are those who have accepted Christ, who have been true to him and faithful, who have chosen to follow him. Those at the end are those who have made the opposite choice. Continuing on, this, the resurrection at the beginning of the thousand years, is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection. Over such, the second death has no power, but they will be priests of God and of Christ, and they will reign with him for a thousand years. And when the thousand years are ended, Satan will be released from his prison and will come out to deceive the nations that are at the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them for battle. Their number is like the sand of the sea, and they marched up over the broad plain of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. But fire came down from heaven and consumed them, and the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur where the beast and the false prophet were, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Now this is a complex passage 
with a lot of other teaching other than what happens to death. I included it in our passages today because it clearly speaks of the resurrection, the resurrection of the righteous and the resurrection of the unrighteous. I'd like to reiterate what my friend had me share with her family at her funeral. When I get to heaven, when I wake up, and it really doesn't matter what your perspective is, okay? You can believe in purgatory. You can believe in an immediate transition and immediate rewards. But when I get to heaven, I expect to wake up after a long sleep. And when I get there, I'm going to be looking for you. We may just be friends on Facebook. But that doesn't matter. I don't broadcast these things because I'm trying to glorify myself or make a name for our church. I do it because I care about you. And if I don't see you on that morning, I'll be heartbroken. So friends, be safe, be prudent, but above all, look up, carry on towards the kingdom. Have a good day.